Uh, my name is Laura Osorio Sonex, and I did used to work at MOA UBC for two years, uh, where I was the Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow for Latin America. Uh, and I currently live in London. I work for the British Museum. Uh, where I run a small research center which is dedicated to Latin American collections. And I'm Anthony Shelton. I'm director of the Museum of Anthropology. Um, I, um, I'm also professor of, of art history at um, UBC. And my lifelong interest has been in Latin America, especially Mexico. I went to Mexico for the first time in 1979 as a graduate student. Um, and uh, my interest was actually in the relationship between so social conventions governing creativity and the freedom of individual artists to express themselves. So I had planned to look at that in Flores in Indonesia and um, unable to get a visa to go to Flores um, at the time. Um, uh, a Mexican friend of mine um, suggested I could do the same kind of work in Mexico. Um, it's a country that has nurtured me throughout my life, my values, my passions, my determination, my flexibility in terms of um, the way I operate in life all come from Mexico. Um, I then left, um, got a job in the British Museum uh, as a curator for um, uh, Latin American collections. I went back to Mexico in the 19, in 1985 um, during the earthquake and uh, I was part of, um, uh, of the rescue operations. Um, and um, I've continued to write about Mexico um, uh, ever since. Well, I'll, 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 so I should like to talk a bit about me then, yeah. So, um, so yes, I'm half Mexican, but actually I grew up mostly in, and as you know, Anthony, I grew up mostly in England but my parents separated when I was a teenager and my father moved to Oaxaca. In terms of the aesthetic experience of Oaxaca, mm. uh, there is so much sort of indigenous um, artistic diversity and mm. there's been an enormous amount of sort of uh, international interest uh, and you know, pan-national, so other parts of Mexican artists that have gone there. Um, and, the, and of course, all of this sort of indigenous artwork and diversity and, um, you know, folklore has been championed by a lot by uh, sort of mainstream artists like Francisco Toledo. Uh, so really it's a, it's a very vibrant and also tense place. Um, and I think sort of the most powerful experience that I had then, if I, if to, to put it that way, was at the very end of the time that my father left Oaxaca and I was about, I was in my early twenties. Uh, and there was a peaceful teachers protest in the main Zócalo, in the main square, that was broken up by the police um, who, yeah, who, who effectively were incredibly violent with um, these peaceful protesters. Um, and it's a very long sort of story and development, but basically um, the protesters ended up fighting back, pushing the police out of the city. Um, and so Oaxaca was under siege by governmental um, and police forces for a while. It was at the time when Banksy was becoming fashionable and so all of this international st graffiti style um, was coming out, but the artists who'd overtaken the city of Oaxaca and were drawing um, all of their sort of political positions, which were anti-state, um, which were pro-indigenous um, or pro-marginalized or pro-radical difference. Um, and they were painting those all over the walls of the, of the streets. If you've ever been to Oaxaca or you've seen images of it, it's these sort of old colonial streets um, sort of beautiful Spanish style houses um, and it's almost sort of picture perfect uh, and uh, the artists were sort of 
completely taking it over and intervening in that. So what? I, so when it comes to sort of the Banksy influence, yes, there was a it sort of a worldwide um, graffiti kind of style that was adopted, but all of the language that was used by the artists to communicate their um, political positions were, were couched in sort of pre-Columbian um, or, or historic images. Uh, so images of the, of the maize goddess, for example, uh, or <clears throat> images of the Coatlicue, who is this kind of uh, sort of earth, um, Aztec earth, earth goddess. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because of course, I mean, I think all, all nations, um, uh, particularly post, you know, sort of uh, post-colonial, um, countries in Latin America have used a pre-Columbian past to kind of bolster uh, new identities and new educational programs that kind of create a mix of what is, you know, the rationality that comes from Europe, um, but the sort of great civilizations of the past and the pre-conquest. And Mexico has done the same thing. And so history and historical images have been used consistently uh, for national building programs that have, I think, effect effectively um, serve to marginalize indigenous people and to historicize them uh, mm -hmm. and to create dominant cultural uh, narratives that mean that other cultural forms or expressions are effectively not endorsed. And so the fact that these kind of uh, radical groups um, of young artists uh, were using uh, those kinds of historic Im historical images, I found very powerful. And so, yes, uh, apart from um, Apart from the fact that I'm that I'm Mexican, and apart from the fact that I probably should have said this as well, I did a PhD in Maya archaeology and heritage. So I have all of this interest in Mexico. But in terms of my, I think my perspective for the exhibition, a lot of it came from from that experience in Oaxaca. So the the past is always present. No, it's always surrounds you. It surrounds you through the architectural ruins of ancient civilizations in modern cities. It surrounds you through the faces of indigenous people in the countryside and in the cities. Um, the media, um, it's uh, the pre-Columbian past and the colonial past is always present in the media. So it's always there. It's like those um, kind of systems of pyramids um, that Octavio Paz talks about when he talks about each age, the pre-Columbian age, the Hispanic um, period and the independence period. Um, each one is built on top of the other and the blood of each one seeps through. Uh, or upwardly to influence um, uh, what is. It's always there. And the way you use that past can be either detrimental or supportive to, um, to indigenous people know. Mm -hmm. You know, popular art is also a form of expression, uh, of popular expression, uh, of resistance um, by indigenous people. You already kind of mentioned the, uh, the muralists in, 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 in Oaxaca but you developed a far more expansive idea of um, the role of popular art throughout Latin America. It said any study of the past says more about the present uh, than, it, than mm. it ever does about the past. Mm. Um, and so I suppose the question is to figure out what you're trying to say about the present. Mm. Um, and I think in the case of popular arts in Latin America, in many cases, they are um, using um, these kinds of visual, mechanisms, but also inserting themselves into international markets, um, mm. making themselves in some senses palatable to the ways that people expect to see popular art, right? People expect it to be inoffensive, to be mm. folkloric, to be pretty, to be, uh, mm. to be devoid really of any kind of soul and depth um, and politicization. Um, mm. But it becomes all the more powerful then when, when they do inject this, uh, these sort of forceful, forceful messages. And I think one of the things that I thought we did quite well in the exhibition was that there was an a huge range of the kind of, of this kind, these kinds of resistances and these kinds, the ways that ancestral culture and knowledge was employed um, in the narratives. Um, everything from, for example, uh, reproductions of the Sarwa paintings. So these are paintings that are made um, uh, in Ayacucho in Peru uh, following the um, Shining Path. Uh, this is just for anyone who, who may not know, um, and um, they document effectively uh, the sort of human rights atrocities committed um, 
as a result of the conflict between uh, the Peruvian government and um, and the sort of communist insurgents, um, and they are brutal, right? I mean, it's like you know massacres um, in the highlands of Peru um, and people bleeding. Uh, and then so so everything from this kind of like subversive documentation, but yes, you, but still using a kind of ancestral painting style, um, which traditionally was used to pass down knowledge from generation to generation in families. Um, mm. From that to something like um, the mural that we commissioned from the Chipibocaniwa mm. Collective, collective, which is Olinda Silvano and Silvia Ricopa, who um, painted this enormous um, sort of geometric, colourful mural, um, which doesn't appear to be political at all. And if, when you know you ask uh, the artists, you know what's this about, and the answer is, oh well, it's it's called Kunur, and it's a it's an ancestral design that we dream and that we kind of conjure from our imaginations, and then we materialise it, and only women can materialise it, um, and we brought it with us for for, for generations, um, and they are just they are, they are women who live in in a diasporic community in Lima, so they live in the capital of Peru, so they've come from from Amazonia where they are original originally from from the Ucayali region. Um, and they effectively they they live by selling um, this kind of sort of folkloric artwork to to tourists and to collectors. Um, and they'll say that the that in a way the politics in their artwork is that they can survive and that they can communicate their culture and they can subvert racism by making something beautiful. Um, but they also heal themselves by making this um, because the practice of making this artwork is related to plants with power. It's related to um, ancestral strength. Uh, and effectively to, yeah, bolstering of identity. So uh, in a sense, that's that's political, but that's not someone holding a gun, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I think, and as they painted in the gallery, they also yeah. sung. Yes, yeah, that's right. Well, that's because, well, because, uh, because Kuna, like plants of power are multi-sensory, right? So they, you can, you can see it and you can also hear it. And mm -hmm. so you can, you can, you can mm -hmm. see the sort of, it's like, they're like, a, they're maps, they're kind of abstract. Um, imagined maps of, of, of the Amazonian forests and um, animals and rivers. Um, mm -hmm. And when, and when you, um, when you, well, they, they put their fingers and they trace the different lines in the maps, uh, they sing that sort of visual expression. It's quite serious, but it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you also included, uh, um, we included um, uh, drawings that had been done by children in, um, in um, in camps, in refugee camps in Salvador, Tuno, which were also extremely haunting in terms of the violence that they depicted. Absolutely, yeah. We so the, the, that was an example of um, of objects that were that were always already in the collection uh, yeah. that we kind of mobilised for the exhibition. So I think you'd you'd collected those, hadn't you? Um, and they was they were collected from um, were they religious groups but that that had gone into the border between the borders between Honduras and El Salvador, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. And kind of used this that basically created workshops um, with the communities who had fled um, across the border to effectively to come to terms with what they'd experienced, which um, which through the which through the images as much as whatever you can read in the news is was clearly um, incredibly uh, violent and traumatizing. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, again, some of the artwork that the, because some of the artwork was made by children, some of it was, they were embroidered by, um, just by adults. Um, and some of it was, you know, you know, machine guns and fire, open fire against children from helicopters into the river. Mm. Whereas some of it was um, memories of their homes and their gardens. Mm. Mm. Um, and then, and then, and pictures of cooking and, and creating gardens in the refugee camps. So, mm. Mm. Uh, a different kind of resistant artwork in that sense, yeah. right? Yeah. And another memorable part of the exhibition, I think, was um, the uh, metal paintings that um, you collected. No, the metal mm. painting is something that's familiar to almost all tourists in Mexico. It's these bark cloth paintings um, that are done in bright coloured colours, usually of villagers and um, fields with crops growing. But a number of artists have started using that medium to tell their stories um, uh, of immigration into the United States and um, what happened to them and the conditions that they had to face uh, while working in the United States. And these are very intricate paintings, much more intricately painted um, than, um, than the traditional tourist ones know. Yeah. 
Yeah, in fact, um, I think there was one one of the paintings. So I, I commissioned and bought five paintings, um, all from different generations of the same family. Uh, again, to express this idea that this is an art production um, community that isn't based on traditional, well, when I say traditional, I mean Western ideas of erudite art uh, education. Uh, it's, uh, it's an artwork that's taught um, from, 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 from parents to children, right? Mm. Um, but uh, yes, one of the one of the artists um, uh, makes these incredibly detailed drawings that are absolutely tiny. But also, it was lovely in the exhibition. We had um, we had a magnifying glass, right? So to to mm. see the detail in the in the painting, you could get you could get up close with the magnifying glass. But yeah. but that was interesting as well because different people in the families had told different stories. And yes, one of them was about migration. Um, the, the family uh, live along the Rio Balsas, which is in Guerrero. And yes, some of the highest uh, rates of migration in Mexico happened between that state. Um, so yeah, one of the stories was about that. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then the one that I, the one that I thought was uh, particularly strong, or one of the ones that I thought was particularly strong, uh, was um, an image of local politicians buying, buying votes. Um, and the, I don't think if you didn't know the context that you would actually easily understand that narrative from the painting because it just has um, police, it just has um, local sort of governmental uh, officials coming around uh, giving out aid um, uh, and giving out bits of money. Um, and then it has the polling station, right? The voting station. Um, and then it has people getting drunk in bars and it all just about very weird um, but it's obviously about um, different kinds of corruption so I think the sort of people going out and you know drinking in bars is kind of a is a synecdoche for um, drug cartels and the effect that drug cartels and extra money that comes from that have, 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 have had in, in the local communities um, and then also this I suppose a sense of um, yeah the idea of badly spent money in a context where you're being given uh, money in exchange for giving away your uh, inalienable human right, which is to uh, participate in your political system without being bought out, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these works that um, we've been discussing are really using traditional media, um, a metal paintings or um, paintings on wood or house beams in the case of the Ayacucho um, painters. Um, but we also um, looked at, um, uh, so they're using traditional media, but the subject is very contemporary and is, um, is, 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 um, uh, is absolutely political. Um, but we also looked at some more traditional um, works that are usually kind of folklorized and um, exoticized. And I'm thinking of the devil masks and the, um, and the um, textiles uh, in the exhibition, the Wipilis from uh, Chiapas. We went on, on a couple of excursions to Guerrero, um, where we bought um, to Tel Huapan, um, a community which um, is, um, you know, has, has been the subject of, um, of, of really kind of a, a lot of violence and um, intimidation of the people who live there. That's coming from the cartels. And um, one family who create these devil, these amazing devil masks and costumes, which are used um, in independent celebrations. Um, we made a collection of those because the idea of the devil uh, in many different communities in Guatemala and Mexico and Peru is um, that the devil somehow or other is ambiguous, not entirely evil, but is ambiguous. You can kind of, you can, you can enlist the help of the devil to aid you, um, but you've got to be careful of him because he will double cross you at any one time. And this whole image of the devil is often associated with Western wealth, material wealth, and also with, um, first of all, with Europeans and um, more later with gringos, you know, and um, uh, mine owners, uh, landowners, um, or, uh, and, 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 and Americans. So, the image of the devil is kind of actually also talks about socio-economic classes and other uh, relationships between them, which is what we tried to bring out now.
Yeah, no. dissecting tables. Oh, what <laughs> what to look like dissecting tables? So we were dissecting. So the costumes were all flat, um, and we were. The idea was the metaphor was that we were dissecting through the folklore to reveal the socio-economic um, significance of, um, of of these costumes. But yeah, no, I mean, in terms of those um, those devil uh, costumes, yes, that, I thought that was an, an interesting part of the. Uh, of the exhibition as well, and another dimension of um, of, of resistance um, was, in a sense, our resistance as curators not to display things as uh, mm. folkloric. That was very much sort of yeah. us, you know. It was us telling the the political narrative, not the the pieces necessarily. Yeah, in fact, the the costumes, as you say, are used for um, are used for local to sort of, yeah, to, to, to reinforce local narratives about history. So yes, they're to celebrate the independence, but not independence the way that everybody else in Mexico yeah. celebrates it. No, the way they celebrate it, which is by dressing up as devils, running around and having a whip cracking contest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in that sense, it is resistant art, um, but it's also us saying, okay, well, this isn't, we could be talking about this as a sort of local cultural practice um, uh, and sort of dissect the sort of historical significance of um, of it, um, or we could be saying, uh, for example, um, what is the significance of looking at these practices as resistant in the context of the area at the moment, which is exactly what you're saying, which is that, um, yes, the whip cracking contest and the dressing up of de of, uh, as devils, and, and they wear these sort of cattle leather, leather, leather um, coats. Um, it, de it definitely evokes a kind of machismo um, and that's particularly poignant in the context of, of the drug cartels and the effect that the drug cartels are having on uh, gender relations and femicide, uh, mm -hmm. but also in terms of people's ability to, to um, you know, uh, practice and celebrate uh, and, to, and, and effectively to exist in an economy without, without th those incursions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the cattle rearing has been replaced by drug cartels is what I'm saying there. I think when we were trying to kind of reinterpret popular art and what you could do with popular art and how you could kind of restore politics into museum exhibition making, uh, it was something of an adventure, but we also had adventures collecting material. <laughs> and um, and um, I think probably a lot of people don't realize what goes into collecting. I mean, people collect material in lots of different ways. There are lots of different local situations. Um, sometimes people go no further than the auction houses to um, uh, to collect. But um, you know, at the Museum of Anthropology, we really place an emphasis on field work. And um, and I was wondering if you would like to say something about some of those adventures, and then I can add to that. <laughs> but maybe we can start with A at Singo. But I suppose what I found um, fascinating is that um, actually the people that we bought the costumes from. Um, were asking us to, to to talk to them about the significance of the of the carnival. They were like, "Well, tell us about it because um, what is this for? It's for an, you know." We were making them sign all these. This is the less fun side of collecting, making them sign all of these documents and sign like sign off copyright and um, you know form paying forms and things like this. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that that's quite that's that that that. I hope people won't take that as, as me saying that these people are ignorant of their heritage and practices, because it's absolutely not true. Um, but 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 importantly, that these that um, you know, I think uh, historians and anthropologists um, and even sort of avid museum goers like to see things in terms of historical development and and what these things, what the significance of these things are is now that ha and it has meant the same thing since the past or maybe has evolved or has changed and want to know exactly how that's happened. Um, yeah. But I think the fact that that uh, they wanted to talk about the sort of historicity and the sort of um, international importance of, of that yeah. uh, World Single Carnival, it just goes to show that the actual significance of it in World Single is exactly what it's supposed to mean every year. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a confusing carnival, no? Because like all carnival, there's lots of different things that are happening at the same time. Um, in a way, again, it kind of compiles different events from different periods of history and enacts them all within the same space and time. 
Um, and so you have the abduction of um, the governor's daughter, I think it is, by, by a bandit. At the same time, you have French troops um, invading Mexico and being repelled by indigenous um, infantrymen. And, and then even, suddenly the, the Turks appear. Yeah, and even the armies of Huitzilopochtli, these are not yes. real people, right? This is mythological yeah, figures. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So yeah. it's a complete kind of collapse of time. It's a kind of a time quake. Um, um, and um, it's such a big event that um, it, it's not the case everywhere in Mexico by a long chalk, um, only in a few places, but in, in, in this particular town, you have embroiderers and you have mask makers and you have carvers working all year round, actually creating the costumes um, for, for, for this event. And, it's, and, and actually what you and I were talking earlier, and I think um, that, that, that this time quaking with Huejotzingo is, is, um, is, an, is, a, is a beautiful example of uh, the, uh, the angel that you, um, the Angelus Novus that you speak of in terms of, uh, and Walter Benjamin, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, I mean, I think you'd better explain it because this is your theory. Well, it's an image that's always haunted me. Kind of, it's one of those images that stay in your mind you now. And, um, and um, you know, it's this image of the angel of history um, where basically the angel is transfixed um, with his back against the future, um, looking at the past and there's a storm. Um, he's fixed on one particular image, which is of a catastrophe. And this catastrophe has created a storm of other images which are smashed and kind of... Um, hurled against uh, the angel um, and lie piling up on the floor in, in, in huge mounds. So again, history is in the present and the angel wants to retotalize all these things, to mend them, but he finds that he's unable um, to, to turn his eyes away from it uh, or to walk to the future. And this is a metaphor no, for Benjamin for progress that really kind of progress is a kind of a breaking of all the things of the past and piling them up um, as, as, as rubble in the present. And for me, I always kind of, I look at culture in that way, um, uh, but I also look at museums as being another example of the rubble of history. There's a crisis of confidence, isn't there, in things like museums and particularly anthropology museums, um, but not just that, also in, in modernity and the way that yeah. seems to be shaping up yeah. <laughs> with climate yeah. climate emergency and the rise of right-wing populism and uh, neoliberal extraction and you know the list goes on mm -hmm. uh, and then at the same time critiques within the discipline and critique you know intellectual critiques about you know the white savior, savior complex or the idea that um, that looking to the past or to looking to other cultures um, will in any, can in any way um, sort of create alternatives for modernity because it's because it's just another appropriation and siloing of of alternative knowledges that effectively have been silenced through this sort of like ideological mm. apparatus that's effectively been intolerant towards them uh, <laughs> throughout the processes of colonialism. Um, but at the same time, there is still this emphasis, emphasis in all of this, in all of these conversations, there's an emphasis on the future. Mm. Um, what's in the future? Mm. Um, and, and I don't know, I think, yeah, um, one of the things that I love about um, Latin American magical realism, and now we're going, I'm going off on a massive tangent now, is, is the way that um, time, and it, and, it, and it comes up in artwork as well, it comes up in um, sort of you know materials and it comes up in 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 books um is how time can be used and galvanized um for just for justice uh, uh, magical realism is really uh, important you know, when we did uh, the exhibition the marvelous real mm. um, at moa um, again we try to kind of look at the landscape beyond the landscape the you know you have the appearance of reality and again, I think this comes, this is, you find this in, um, in Mexica, in Aztec um, cosmology, and also in the cosmology of contemporary people in Mexico, that um, the reality we see, there are two levels of reality. There's the, um, rea there's a world of appearances, 
and then there's the world of essences, if you like, and the Wichol would call it essences, which is the world as it was created by the sacrifice, through the sacrifice of deities and the transformation to form the lakes and the mountains. Um, and, you know, it's through pilgrimage and through, um, um, through denying the needs of the physical body and taking, in the case of the Wichol peyote, to release the imagination um, that you and and at the same time that you're undertaking these pilgrimages, which can last up to a month, um, you have shamans who are telling you the origin stories at the same time. And through going through that process of denying the needs of the physical body and releasing the imagination, you come to see the true nature of reality. Um, which is this world of essences as it was, was created. And I think when we did that exhibition, people said to me, I remember some people saying to me, well, don't we have a sense of um, magical realism in British Columbia? And of course we do. I mean, the stories are indigenous stories that are not well known, but the landscape as well is an inscribed la landscape now full of, um, full of its own meaning. And, I often think what we need to do and what's really important for life and for, for vitality is to see beyond this commoditized landscape that surrounds us and to know the stories. And I think that's what museums can do. And that's what certain types of um, exhibitions and certain types of research can bring to the fore. It can return our humanity because I think we've lost our humanity. I think it was a really important exhibition because it was explicitly political. Um, it wasn't implicit, it was explicit, and it offered a different image to the, of the history of Mexico, not one based on romanticism, but one based on, on real economic situations and political marginalization that um, indigenous Mexico is facing today and other parts of Latin America too are. Basically. Absolutely. And I think, you know, and this is, uh, again, conversations that you and I had, but I think it's incredibly important myself um, to be to be explicit uh, mm. about curatorial positions, because yeah. how much people uh, critique the sort of uh, Enlightenment derived neutral narratives that a lot of museums or master narratives that museums create. Um, I still feel like um, a lot of archaeological material and a lot of ethnographic material is displayed apolitically. Yeah. Um, and I think the I think the public personally, I could be wrong, but I think the the public is beginning to ask for more from from museums, particularly world museums. Yeah, yeah. And There's museums with collections that uh, relate to colonial yeah. practices, processes, yeah. etc. And in a globalized world where exhibitions are written about and disseminated, not only through writing, but through television and through videos and documentaries, you no, know, it's a kind of an additional ethical um, uh, requirement that really uh, is placed on all of us, on all curators. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Kana <laughs> Bidi bidi shamangi, bidi bidi shamangi, mutsa mutsa shamangi, soi soi ya bangi, soi soi bangi, nukana ta shamangi.